to this yeah. second event of the Enterprise Blockchain uh, Working Group of the Crypto Valley Association. I'm very thrilled and excited to have a good audience today uh, of different uh, showcases in the Enterprise Blockchain world. Uh, let me quickly introduce the, uh, the panelists today. And um, one panelist is, is uh, Johannes uh, Hinkeldane from the yeah. Technical yeah. University of, um, of, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, of uh, Hamburg. Um, he's joined by Timo Schneider, one of his students, and, uh, and they are uh, dialing in from Hamburg. Then we have Junian Lapic uh, from the company Un, um, Uncrypted from Geneva. Uh, talking today uh, with us about uh, um, trade execution uh, solutions. Then uh, from Singapore, we have uh, our colleague uh, Wei, um, uh, uh, Shike Wei from uh, Longhash uh, Ventures. Um, we have uh, from the blockchain um, center of the University of Zurich, uh, Claudio Tesone, Professor Claudio Tesone. Then Benjamin Shaw from Stacks, as well in Singapore, uh, talking to us about uh, enterprise uh, blockchain solutions in the digital uh, asset exchange uh, area. And Bayard Banwart from UBS at, um, presenting today his insights on uh, retrade uh, at trade platform on blockchain uh, solutions for small and medium enterprises. Um, today, my co-moderator is uh, Mauro Capiello. He's my co-chair as well in the Enterprise Blockchain Solutions. And as well, very warmly welcome him and together with Jerome Bailey, um, who's our uh, executive uh, director from uh, the Crypto Valley Association. And in the background, we have Rally Hill, who is uh, coordinating our speech here. And this would be a very interactive session, so we will have a lot of discussions and I would re really invite you as uh, participants or, or viewers and of this, uh, of this uh, uh, virtual event as well to ask your questions. You have at the very bottom of your screen the Q&A button. And uh, if you have a question, please don't hesitate to uh, uh, type in uh, the question into the Q&A session. And we may then as well dial you in to the, that you can uh, ask your questions live uh, to the audience here. So don't hesitate to ask us, it would be a very interactive session. Well, let me quickly just um, uh, give you a quick update where we are with the enterprise blockchain solution of the Crypto Valley Association. I'm very thrilled that we are um, have here an exciting group of uh, of uh, a core team uh, working with us um, on a white paper on success factors for enterprise blockchain solutions. This is really exciting work because we have from different industries a lot of people uh, from the luxury good industry to uh, the voting industry who through finance industry, everybody in there. And it's really exciting that we work on, on, a, on a white paper at the moment, which we are hopefully uh, can, um, when everything goes, uh, goes as it should, uh, launch after the summer break uh, and make it public to everybody. Um, that is one of the key activities we do in the Crypto Valley um, uh, Association or in this working group, the Enterprise Blockchain Working Group. And uh, apart from that, I quickly want to hand over to Mauro. We are as well working with the universities on various uh, research topics um, on the success factors of enterprise blockchain solutions. And concerning for that as well, we have today a poll which we want to like to invite you to as well let us know what kind of topics should we research in the future a little bit further. But Mauro, do you want, what, quickly want to say something about that? Yes, uh, thanks, Dennis. So for us, so uh, in the last uh, months, we have been collaborating with different uh, institutions and universities to basically uh, identify uh, potential students uh, and topics which we could further research, with, and then we can bring back to this group as input, which allows you know corporations to then you know make more educated decisions about which blockchains they want to use, what kind of solutions are out there what are the hurdles kind of they have to overcome. 
And so basically we have put together uh, one, uh, a list of about, you know, 20 topics that we would like to research, but obviously we cannot do all 20 of them at the same time. So uh, when the pooling will uh, show up, you can basically select uh, one uh, topic for each section. So one is financial industry, the other one is supply chain. So uh, we really hope to get feedback from everybody here to get the steer. Uh, what are what is most interested? Uh, what you guys are most interested in, and then we can do some research with the schools. Uh, we also have established, with the help from the university from Hamburg, from Hannes, uh, kind of a list of about 60 other uh, universities which are doing uh, currently work and, and research on uh, on blockchain. So we will also make that available uh, to the members uh, through the CVA infrastructure uh, soon. So I think, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's kind of all I wanted to update. So I'm very glad, if, uh, happy if you can provide feedback. And Rally will now um, start the, the polling. Uh, you're going to have time to do that throughout the session. And so we'll be very, uh, thank you already now. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So what is the working group all about? The working group is really to exchange with corporates and universities about the success factors, the business aspects behind blockchain uh, solutions. Technically, I think uh, there are a lot of solutions are, are there. Technically, we have proven that blockchain uh, and distributed ledger solutions are, are, are valuable and work. But of course, the question is, how do we bring such solutions and uh, networks alive? Um, how, what is needed from a business perspective uh, to really make uh, these solutions uh, a, a success. And um, in that context, I would like uh, today that we could perhaps see different showcases around the world. And I would like to uh, start with, with you, Johannes, uh, to perhaps quickly uh, introduce us to the initiative that the Technical University of Hamburg is currently um, uh, doing. And um, yeah, so please, the word is up to you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, yeah, hello from Hamburg. Um, I'm sitting here together with one of uh, my students, uh, Timo Schneider, and uh, we are both from the Institute for Technical Logistics, which means we are actually concerned with all I would say technical or engineering topics of logistics and supply chain um, and blockchain being uh, one of them, a, a really important topic, of course. And we have been currently working a lot on uh, blockchain solutions for supply chain and logistics. Um, as you have heard, uh, blockchain has got various instances um, for applications in, in blockchain and logistics such as uh, tracking of objects, but also blocked uh, supply chain finance. And um, a quite interesting and important topic for us is at the moment the introduction of um, blockchain standards to logistics and supply chain. So as you all know, uh, supply chains and logistics is uh, very much about standards. So for example, um, you can probably remember the um, the 40 foot, uh, 40 foot container um, in maritime logistics was, has um, been done in the 60s and has uh, decreased harbor costs by about 90%. So, and, um, so everything in blockchain, uh, everything in supply chain and logistics is very much about, um, about standards. And we have been evaluating um, the existing blockchain standards for supply chain and logistics. And we have been doing also a small prototype on that. And that's the reason why um, Timo is here with me because uh, he just finished his master thesis about that. And we evaluated, uh, maybe you have heard the uh, beta standards, the blockchain in transport alliance standards, which is a blockchain alliance in the, in, in the US mainly um, with a lot of uh, big uh, logistics groups where they define common or standard data models and data structures and um, how to introduce uh, tracking and location um, throughout the whole supply chain. And um, yeah, that's basically what we have been doing um, for the last year. And probably I think we will introduce some of our uh, results later on in the discussion. Yes, that's very, very good. Thank you. 
Um, so what are the kind of key findings you found in your, in your, current, um, in your current thesis on, on the standards? What are, what, and how are we defining those standards? How would you describe that? So what, what the standards are mainly about, um, as Johan Singleton already said, are about location. So how do we get location information onto the blockchain? So what the standard from, from the YTA uh, Alliance um, did was give a structure on how to implement, for example, a street, a city name, something like that, really basic, but uh, in my opinion, really important um, for a standardized approach. And how they basically did it was they created an JSON object, so a data structure on how to implement um, those logistical information and um, how to approach um, a, a storage on the blockchain. Um, uh, exactly, and what, what we did was um, we built a prototype just to showcase that standard on an Ethereum blockchain and we found some positive and negative aspects about the standard itself um, but i think that's up for discussion later on um, yes so it's basically a data structure on how to get logistical information onto the blockchain okay good thank you so uh, another uh, company uh, we have today in our panel uh, group uh, that is probably already far beyond uh, prototyping uh, that has real solutions uh, uh, out there in the market and supports many, many uh, or various uh, Asian uh, stock exchanges for digital assets, that is Stax. And I'm very, well, uh, very pleased to welcome today uh, Benjamin Shaw, uh, who will give us a quick introduction on Stax. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to meet you. My name is Ben. I'm from Stax, co-founder and managing director. I'm based in Singapore. So Stax is a company that has deployed live blockchain infrastructure consisting of the underlying Stax blockchain, the layer of uh, API functionality to connect to external platforms, and also a range of front-end user interfaces that we have developed to allow our clients to be able to use the blockchain effectively. So our clients, as Dennis pointed out, are financial institutions. Some of them are national stock exchanges, global investment banks, and also asset managers handling hundreds of billions of dollars in trading. So what they do with our infrastructure is that they are able to now enjoy real-time trade confirmation and reconciliation on the shared ledger across multiple participants. They are able to enjoy instant delivery versus payments when it comes to transactions. And of course, the use of smart contracts for certain automated transactions if and or based on conditions that are already written into the program. So this is how we are hoping to be able to bring about, you know, real world enterprise implementation of the blockchain. And we'd be happy to discuss more uh, during this session. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, a totally different use case uh, we, um, are, is, is, uh, is a case that Uncrypted, as a, a consultancy company in Geneva, is, uh, is uh, as well uh, consulting and, 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 and supporting um, uh, in, in the trade um, execution uh, area for commodity traders, where, of course, you have a hub in, in Geneva. And uh, yeah, that is um, uh, Julian uh, Lapic, and perhaps you would quickly introduce that initiative to us. Sure. Uh, hi, Denis. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks to the, to the CVA for organizing uh, such events. I think it helped promote the, the adoption of blockchain worldwide, so it's, it's very useful. Thank you for, for organizing these events. Uh, my name is Julian. I'm leading the blockchain practice of a consultancy specialized in digital transformation and, and blockchain, where we advise traditional players on how they could use blockchain to optimize their business processes. And uh, the case I want to talk about today is Coventis. Uh, Coventis is an initiative led by ADM, Bungay, Cargill, Dreyfus, Glencore, and Kofco uh, to modernize global trade operations. So basically over the past two years, 
they have uh, got together, they put together an initiative in order to develop a blockchain platform that will help them to optimize their current processes. Just to give you a bit of background for those of you that are not familiar with the industry, uh, two main facts, let's say that over the past 20 years, the last technological advancement in this industry has been the introduction of emails. Uh, after that, not much has been done. And when we talk about commodity trading, we're more talking about day, -day trading documents instead of trading commodities. So when you put these two facts together, you start to realize that maybe there is something wrong. Uh, today, users, to, in order to ship the more than 11,000 uh, ships that we see in, on a yearly basis for the agri-commodity industry, uh, users are spending an enormous amounts of time exchanging emails copy-pasting uh, the information of the different vessel of the different commodities. And it's a very, very manual process. It's very prone to error. It's very repetitive and it's absolutely not efficient. So based on that realization, uh, some players in the industry, some of the biggest actually decided to get together in order to create a, a digital platform that will optimize this entire process. And that's how the Cobentis initiative was, uh, was formed. The idea is to create to use blockchain the blockchain technology in order to decentralize the, the process and act as a single source of truth so that the different parties that are onboarded on the platform they can exchange documents in a safe and secured way in order to optimize the processes. The, the platform enables them to get end-to-end -end visibility on tasks that are today uh, on that, that today they are completely blind on it. So it will help them to save a lot of time, save a lot of cost, and focus on more value added services. Um, that's, uh, that's, the main, uh, that's the main point regarding Coventis. The product, product is going to be live uh, in July, so this month. And uh, after more than two years of uh, iteration and production, uh, hopefully it will be a great success. We hope so too. Uh, I think, um, yeah, this was now an initiative that was strongly driven by actually the, the companies, the commodity traders themselves. Um, now let me bridge to another initiative uh, that is slightly different, but was uh, mainly uh, driven by the financial industry. And I'm very welcome, uh, very pleased to welcome Beat uh, Bangwart from UBS, who will quickly introduce us to the V-Trade initiative. Yeah, hello to everyone. I'm happy to, to be here represented um, on the panel and to give a bit insight on the initiative which is called WeTrade. Um, for the ones which do not know the platform, it is a, WeTrade is a consortium um, which was initiated and owned by 12 international banks with a, with a large footprint across Europe. And the goal of WeTrade is basically to enable corporates um, to trade simply, quickly, and trustfully with each other. As just alluded to in the in, in, in the prior explanations, um, the, the reason why we did initiate um, that platform was that trade um, is actually um, giving quite a bit of challenges, or basically international trade, quite a bit of challenges to the um, to the participants across the value chain. And just to give you a few numbers, there is the so-called um, 1.5 trillion trade finance gap, which is a huge number and which is nothing else than to show what is the value of trade, which actually was sought to be done, but couldn't be done because the parties couldn't get enough liquidity to finance those transactions or they couldn't get enough security um, to avoid any losses in the trade. And the reason is because trade is a super heterogeneous um, environment. They're about in, in a normal trade transaction, there can be up to 20 involved parties um, for the traditional products, which do actually mitigate the, the, the risks of default or non-payment. There are on average about 36 paper-based documents involved. And as just mentioned before, that's a, that's a highly manual, a highly time-consuming, um, and for that reason also pretty costly um, workload. And for that reason, if you look at all of global trade, there's only about 15% of that volume um, is therefore being protected or risk mitigated um, by the available um, products which are on the market. And that's exactly here where we trade actually kicks in. The goal here was not to simplify per se the, the paper-based process which is in place, but to complement that 
and come with an entirely end-to-end -end digital and very simple solution um, which allows those trading parties um, to, to make trade much more secure and simple. And just briefly, what are the main features and which are there involved? Um, number one is um, there is uh, an interactive and a shared repository um, of those trade agreements or the trade transactions which the client have engaged within. So basically, instead of emails or, or, or um, papers which are going back and forth, they can go on the platform, they can specify the transaction, which is then encrypted in a smart contract and which can be reviewed and approved by, by the two parties which are within the trade. And then based on those agreements, um, there is the, 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 the functionality number one, which is not to settlement based on the conditions. And I'll just quickly explain afterwards what that means and, and where the power is of the smart contract and the blockchain solution. And based on that, there's a payment assurance. So basically, um, if, if it, the, the buyer doesn't have enough money or in the worst case has gone out of business, um, that it, it can be assured to the seller he's still getting the money for the goods he was shipping out. And then last but not least, he can finance um, that transaction. So if you have payment terms, for example, 60 days payment after delivery, um, the, the seller can, can pre-finance that amount. And just maybe very briefly, how that auto settlement function works, which is basically the basis of it all. So imagine um, that you agree with someone to, to enter into a, into a transaction. So you basically buy, um, let's say, a machine from someone. Um, you would then go on the WeTrade platform. You can key in the, the type of the goods. So what machine is this? What's the cost of the machine? So basically the invoice, um, when should it be shipped? And basically how many days do you have to pay? And as soon as you have locked that in, um, you create and activate that smart contract. And then the whole shipping information and as well like further data you can source from other participants is being fed into that smart platform. And I basically imagine you're at the, at the door, um, like DHL or UPS is coming, is, is handing out the, um, the machine to you. You sign off electronically on the terminal and that is then triggering automatically the, the settlement of the of the invoice so in other words um for the seller he exactly knows that when he's shipping the machine he's getting the money at the pre-agreed times while as for the buyer um for him it's no risk he has to prepay or um he has to to pay if there's no goods delivered um that this is being assured on both sides and this is the key value proposition how we basically make that process um which was taking days previously, and um, just in a few clicks and a few minutes to, to set it up. Thank you, Bert. Uh, yeah, I think it, it, it seems to me when I hear now all these uh, in these use cases that replacing a um, very uh, paper-based and 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 slow process by something that is decentralized and uh, standardized and um, with with uh, yeah with, with blockchain technology or distributed ledger technology behind it, um, it, it seems to be a very very key use case for a couple of your of uh, of, of these uh, enterprise uh, blockchain solutions. And I mean, at the end, it's all about that. Enterprise blockchain uh, or ent enterprise solutions are of course about process optimization. And I'm very uh, pleased as well to welcome uh, GK from Longhash. Um, it's uh, long hash. Probably you just describe it yourself. It is it is an, uh, an uh, accelerator uh, in blockchain solutions in Singapore, and of course enterprise blockchain solutions are as well uh, a key topic that that your company is focusing on, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. So hi everyone. I'm Shikai from Long Hash Ventures. We are an Asia-focused blockchain accelerator as well as investor. And so far, we have accelerated about 18 companies. Uh, out of all of them, raise a total of uh, above 18 million or so. So uh, in terms of enterprise blockchain, it has always been a focus for us because we believe that uh, the adoption by enterprises is one of the directions that can bring this blockchain industry to a more mature or mainstream stage. That's why about 20 to 30 percent of all the companies have accelerated or invested in actually are in this B2B enterprise space. 
And I look forward to sharing about some of these insights or how some of these teams have with you during this panel. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Shikai. And of course, uh, it would be not an, uh, an enterprise blockchain uh, workshop from the Crypto Valley when we would not have the academia uh, involved. And apart next to the uh, Technical University of Hamburg, uh, we have as well uh, Claudio from the Blockchain Center of the University of Zurich. And I think one of the topics that you are always researching is how to bring um, block enterprise blockchain solutions alive and what are the kind of success factors behind that, isn't it? Yes, thank you very much uh, for your kind of introduction, Denise. So uh, to me, the most important things are uh, in a way related to many of the key uh, factors that were mentioned before in this round of introduction. One of them is uh, how to ensure that actually decentralization in this system is uh, good and healthy in a way, because one can always, uh, just because we are proposing a blockchain-based solution, claim that this is a decentralized uh, implementation of our data storage. But at the end of the day, when we see the data, when we see how the system is at the end deployed, we recognize that uh, like it happened with the first generation of cryptocurrencies, for example, or with some of the consortium blockchains that are out there, we realize that they are heavily centralized. So the question of the blockchain comes, are you really having a blockchain that is trustworthy as you may assume that you have? And on the other hand, the second pillar, uh, this is one of the things, uh, keeping decentralization, uh, designing the right incentives to um, achieve that, and on the second hand, another important aspect of our research is developing sophisticated analytic tools to leverage on the data that we are storing. Because it was said a couple of times now, we are transforming our old paper records into digital ones. But actually, this allows us to do automated intelligence systems uh, that to do decision making processes or to create early warning indicators and also to understand in other ways the healthiness of the ecosystem and this is the kind of research that we are also developing now you just mentioned the famous buzzword uh, of uh, 2019 i think ecosystem huh? and um, as i see that we have two showcases today that really are already alive and two that are, uh, in, uh, are going alive or are in a, in a, in a, in a, in a showcase or a pilot phase. So my question now to, to Ben and Bea would be uh, probably when you look back you launch these solutions now already or your solutions already now a couple of months ago or even years ago. What in when you look back what were key success factors to really make your solutions a success so that they that they you know um, are now used uh, by by multiple parties and by multiple players then perhaps what what would, would you say i guess the one of the most important things that we did was to be able to integrate many of the existing um, technology platforms that the institutions are already using to the blockchain. So what we did, instead of replacing the current front end that they are using, so just as an example, one of the platforms that is live today is integrated to a trading platform. The trading platform that most or in fact the majority of the asset managers are using when they are placing trades. So this is the, the, the trading platform that they are really using today. Uh, they are already used to it. And we all know that the trading should always appear or always occur okay, on the centralized trading engine that's already mature and established. So without replacing that, however, okay, we are allowing this trade information to flow directly to our blockchain infrastructure okay, through some form of integration, technical integration. And that allows them to still have the real time of so-called high frequency algorithmic trading on the front, but yet on the back, okay, they are able to enjoy the efficiencies of the blockchain. Where in this case, you know, their pain point was 
every single broker or asset manager or you know clearing house down the entire value chain was on a different ledger different system different time zone sometimes and of course handling different asset classes different currencies such that many times this entire trade reconciliation is a manual process so we were able to isolate the pain point the pain point is you know the manual operations in the back office uh, costing a typical company mid-sized company about 2,000 man hours a month right so we are able to put all of this okay into a very focused box whereby you know these trades will still happen on the front but now on the back the entire network of brokers you know clearing houses custodians they can now be on the same ledger distributed ledger whereby they will all be able to see the information in real time and therefore uh, with some form of computing they are able to reconcile the trades instantly saving them thousands of man hours each so in other words long story short is we are able to integrate some of the not just the processes, but also the existing technology into the blockchain. I think that's been key to us. Mm -hmm. And on yeah. your side, Bayard, what would you say is a, was a key or is a key success factors to make Retrade uh, a global platform? Yeah, I think the key success factor is obviously you need to solve a, a real customer problem um, because there should obviously be an incentive for the for the end user. Um, to use the platform that it, that it will get adopted. And so how we started, it was really kind of start with the pain points and, and um, like the user personas. So typically like the design thinking um, start. And then as part of the further refinement, kind of really just focus on the, on the key problem and try to simplify as much as possible. Um, because it's also particularly in the area of trade, it's a, it's a very heterogeneous, it's a very complex environment. And if you want to solve all the problems in one go, um, you will for sure not um, reach the, well, reach the finish line. So we were really focusing on, on, let's say, the vital point. And if you look now, like equally, what you heard before, what were the costs for, um, for a company doing these processes, we just looked at how smaller or let's say mid-sized companies but can also be large companies how they're functioning and what effectively a loss of a transaction is costing to them just maybe small example um, so if if a company is, is dealing with many counterparties and you can also see that the sales losses which are being experienced across different countries they vary but they're still in the mid single digit um, percentage size and that means if, for example, a company is losing 100,000 um, in uncollected receipts, and if they're operating at the 2% profit margin, it means they have to sell 5 million more in goods just to make up for that 100,000 loss. So this is actually quite the challenge, and, and it's quite an effort. But like I said, today, um, given the, the complexity of the existing offerings, that was just not possible um, to, to handle like a protection for that sale. So kind of very simple, the value proposition you have to come up with has to be straight, very straightforward. It has to be very simple and you have to be able um, to show it in some very simple numbers. That's kind of the number one. And then of course, number two is um, you need to start with a critical mass as well um, when you go to marketing in that space particularly because trade is per default Per, per default international. So you have to basically rally um, a sufficiently large net network behind you that there's also significant impact on the companies when they start, start to use that, that product. So kind of in short, start with the, a, a, a very tangible and a very concrete use case. Um, keep it simple um, as much as possible, but that it has a, a clear value proposition and then get a sufficiently large crowd behind you that it also makes sense in terms of, a, of an adoption in reality for the end user. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Shikai, I mean, when you, you, you have various uh, enterprises in your, in your accelerating uh, program and some succeed, some fail. Uh, so what would you say are, are things when, when, you, when you decide in what kind of companies you're investing or you're taking in under the umbrella of your accelerator, what are the key things that you're watching out uh, for? 
Yep, yep, exactly. So it's a bit different from, I think my perspective will be slightly different from what everyone will be sharing here, which is like, you are already building this relevant solution, right? So how do you make it right? For us, uh, we are more concerned about how to pick the right teams. And picking the right teams comes down to picking the right people. So with startups, we, we believe that people are still the most valuable asset. And why we say that? Because firstly, the team needs to know the right people within the industry. Often we find the, the most successful startups are the ones either you're coming from the industry where you're trying to solve the problem off. And that means that you know the people really well. So you have a starting point for your like this development for your sales. And it also means you understand the problem truly well. Uh, unlike, you know, perhaps uh, if, if a company is, let's say, more focused on the ideology of the project, on the technology, and they think, okay, this is a very good potential use case, but they build it before speaking to potential customers. They, they build it before knowing about the details of the pain point that is often a red flag for us. So we find that uh, domain experience will be the number one. And that leads to my second point, which is if you're from the relevant domain uh, uh, with the experience, or perhaps you have advisors or partners who help you with it, it also helps you be very clear on the problem, the details, of it, and how do you solve it. Because often blockchain is not the only solution needed to address the, the problem. I think like many of us saying here, like, you know, it's, it's digitizing from paper to, to that process, right? So you need to know the end-to-end -end gap of like from this current state to get to your imagined uh, best seamless uh, blockchain-based state. What are all the gaps that, that are needed, right? Who are all the players that need to work together to make it happen? Often, if it's from an industry such as supply chain, right? So if you're looking at like food supply chain or like a goods, uh, this kind of agriculture, healthcare, this kind of things, when you have physical things, you need an IoT device, for example, to track uh, across the, all the players uh, for, for you to scan and so on. Whereas if it's something that's already fundamentally digital, such as like uh, financial applications, fintech, it's, it's slightly easier because uh, technically the products are already electronic. You just need to tokenize them on the back end or you're already running a platform, let's say, to manage trades, and you just don't want you to tokenize it on the back end. The digital representation is much easier. And then finally, on the team as well, a good team would also demonstrate that they're able to execute. Once you have the connections, you have the product, then you're able to deploy and execute these solutions effectively. Right. Uh, what, what do you mean by execute, right? Just for enterprises, uh, typically with their amount of resources and size, they can easily just build a solution on their own or they can go ahead and acquire a whole company. Why should they engage a startup to uh, offer their services for such a solution? Often that means that uh, compared to these alternatives, they want something that is low risk, easy to enter, and they are able to use it very quickly. So that's the advantage of working with startups. And you have to be able to demonstrate that very quickly show the ROI and how it is start getting those benefits and pluses of course if you can make it a completely seamless experience to integrate the current systems like what Ben has mentioned. Uh, the easiest way to do this is often you know secure some kind of uh, LOI or pilots and then you once you're able to show that show the progress then we convert that to a, a full-time deployment. So stem from the team to recap right you know the people, you get to know the problem, build a very suitable product, and then you execute based on that. Okay, that, you, you mentioned a very important thing. is it, It's the people that need to drive it forward. It's as well the people with the vision uh, to have it. So, so Julian, I, I, I imagine that to be very, very difficult in a consortium like you have described. I mean, uh, Shike just mentioned, I mean, basically the enterprises can do it all themselves. And, and you had this project in a very, very competitive market. I know the trading market as well. And you had the, the, the prime of the prime commodity traders. I mean, the Glencores, the Bungas, the Trafiguras, and so they were all there. You know, how was it to manage all these, these large enterprises and get them aligned on one solution? difficult as you can imagine uh, 
consortium initiative have always the same uh, facing the same issue uh, in the room until you get to an independent legal entity uh, you have still competitors in the same room they might agree to work on a very small project on a very specific spo scope but in the end outside of this room they will still be competitors you, so you need to make sure that the vision that you have and the value proposition that you offer uh, will be relevant for all the different users around the table I think what, what has been key here is to, to make sure that adoption was going to be the, the only metric of success. So it, it, they needed to solve the problem, yes, for themselves initially, because they were the, the one launching the initiative, but they knew as well that without the network effects, uh, if you don't have the other participants on board, if you don't do an, an initiative by the industry, but also for the industry, then in the long run, you're going to fail. So there, they quickly understood that even though they might be the brightest or the best or the biggest or the you name it in the end they're all facing to some extent the same issues and in order to solve them efficiently you need to find a solution that will be adopted by a very uh, by a very large network in order for the, the the benefits to become tangible because if you only build your your solution even though if you, you might be cargill or anyone if you're the only one using it uh it will just become an internal system and then you will still need to connect to the outside world so the key here is to to make sure that you're able to connect with the people outside of your consortium initiative yeah i think that is that's the key thing i mean you need to find the common commonality uh, behind the different parties uh, that everybody is suffering with. I mean, Beat just mentioned a, a similar uh, that uh, Ben was talking about that, and so I imagine uh, Johannes uh, and Timo that this, the standardization that you're talking about, uh, that you are um, researching at the moment, is exactly going into the right, in the same direction. So uh, standardization is probably missing, and and your initiative is now helping here to get some some uh, common standards uh, on blockchain uh, to across the different companies yes um i mean uh, standards and standardized processes um it's um always it's always a key success factor in logistics and supply chains so um all this um central decentralization and all these networks and all these consortiums are um anyhow present in logistics, in trade, supply chains, where you have uh, a lot of uh, suppliers, um, sometimes a pyramid um, of the OEMs uh, with the different uh, tiers of suppliers. And uh, if you want to assure um, data flows across all these tiers, across all these stages of supply chains, it's rather important to have standards. So, and, and that's also the reason um, and, and missing standards are also the reason why um, transparency is such an, such an issue uh, for supply chains. So, um, and transparency is also the topic which is often related to blockchain and uh, logistics and supply chain world. And the question is now how we can achieve that because uh, if you have so many different suppliers, you need um, to integrate different IT systems with different data structures and uh, align everything so that data can flow throughout the whole supply chain and you can track objects um, throughout the whole supply chain. And this is not possible if you don't apply any standards for that. So, well, yeah, exactly, perfect. Um, uh, what I wanted to add for that, because I really enjoyed what CK said, um, because I think the most important thing for ventures is probably get to know the people and get to know the problem. But um, for myself, I had the same experience um, facing standards because for many of the, for example, we are coming from a logistical expect, uh, perspective, many of the people don't really know how they can implement blockchain to solve their problem. And it's the same approach that uh, the BITA, for example, I'm spoiling, spoiler, spoilering now the, the results of my thesis, but uh, what we basically found out was that um, they, aren't, they aren't really aware of what the actual problem with blockchains regarding to supply chains is, because what we found out is that 
uh, interoperability between blockchains isn't really covered. Uh, a main finding was that the standards weren't technology agnostic because they were based on private networks like Hyperledger Fabric and we tested it on the prototype with Ethereum and we found out that it wasn't simply convertible and I think that that's in the same category as I think GK put it, um, be aware of the problem you're actually trying to solve and I think interoperability is for blockchains one of the biggest key factors in the future because um, for what I believe and for what my company I'm working for, Chainslip in Hamburg, is believing that there is not the one single uh, blockchain that will be the main factor for implementing the technology around the world, but there are many specific cases and many different um, tasks you can solve with the blockchain and different blockchains. And I think to conclude and um, to conclude is that standards, at least the newest or the earliest ones, aren't really adopting a problem or aren't really sure, uh, aware of the problem um, blockchain is facing. And yeah, that's, um, I think, a good point for the whole perspective, like get to know the people, but also the problem. And I think that um, adds to what the previous people uh, already said. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, you just mentioned interoperability, and uh, and I think that is that is for 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 the scaling of solutions uh, and platforms a, a big problem because I think there is not the one platform uh, that everybody has to uh, serve here because. Um, me personally, I think the, the real benefit of blockchain solutions is that it is decentralized, that it is the market participants that are defining uh, together the standards, but still have a certain uh, independency on technology platforms on, on these things. So interoperability becomes a really success, uh, a key success factors for the entire ecosystem to really evolve. And, and, and by the way, uh, uh, Mauro, I just saw that we don't have that as a, as a topic on our research uh, poll, uh, but we have many, many other topics on the research poll. So please, um, for the audience, uh, go to the poll uh, and, and as well uh, tell us what kind of research topics shall we do together with the universities from a Crypto Valley perspective and, and research there. And I think we have as well a question on scaling and interoperability. Yeah, exactly. So maybe just a first point, um, you know, I'll, I'll quickly will chat my email. If you have additional topics you would like to research, send it to me. Uh, the poll itself cannot pick up interactive text. Um, that's kind of number one. I will chat that in a minute. And then, as you said, Dennis, we had a question from Alexander Filatov, which was kind of one which we know uh, from, you know, many years. Uh, how critical is uh, scalability and throughput of the protocols in the enterprise blockchain space? Uh, I think, you know, some of them you guys maybe answered already, but it would be good to kind of get an understanding. Uh, I think sometimes, you know, we have products and services on the blockchain which are decentralized and potentially the speed is actually not as critical as we think, but the other services and product where, um, you know, obviously it's very important to have uh, speed and, uh, uh, scalability. So I would like to kind of hear from you guys what you think and answer uh, uh, Alexander's question. Yeah, so who can I uh, put the question to us? Who wants to answer first on that? I mean, especially in trading, I think, uh, Ben, it is a, it's, it's a critical one. Yes, <laughs> yeah, so basically I do echo Mauro's point. It's definitely depending on the use case. So I don't think we're going to challenge the uh, front end trade execution, whereby I still think that would be handled by trading platforms. And by trading, I mean financial markets trading. 
okay, stock market trading, etc. Okay, but however, uh, what we have done so far is scalable enough for the B2B settlements. Uh, what we have done so far is we have built a blockchain that can handle 4,500 transactions per second. And that essentially is a wide enough buffer for all the use cases that we've been involved in so far. Noting that a lot of the trade settlements are actually handled on a batch or net basis. Yeah, so therefore, I do think that what we have in terms of our gross payments from a B2B perspective is good enough. From an information flow perspective, it's also good enough. But therefore, we also do not want to get into the area of uh, uh, trading transactions where it can easily, uh, we, we would definitely easily find other more mature technologies that do not require the advantages of the blockchain. Any, anybody else, you know, I think, uh, I don't know, maybe trade finance or other, uh, you know, uh, areas of solutions we have heard because I, I definitely think there's, there's probably different requirements for different groups. Yeah, maybe can something say to trade finance. Um, so obviously, as mentioned before, it's super dependent on the use case and trade finance. Imagine um, people have been used to that process taking days before. So even if that's still taking five seconds um, or 10 seconds until you confirm the transaction back. Um, that's more than good enough for that use case. So basically from that perspective, it was also a good one because there is still enough time um, you can take to, to confirm a transaction. Yeah. I think we start as well with a lot of these use cases. I mean, you, you mentioned it, Julian mentioned it, uh, Joanna's mentioned it. These, you have today very, time consuming use cases in these supply chain and post trade execution or trade execution. And of course you are now replacing those ones with blockchain based or distributed ledger based uh, electronic uh, workflows. Um, but do you see that we are uh, coming in the future probably at some, at some limitations uh, that we need to overcome? And um, if yes, what could be those kind of uh, limitations? I don't know, Julian, you, you have not been yet live, but what's your view? Yes, so what we see, okay, the use case is definitely, uh, it's not only the use case that you're trying to solve, it's also uh, the benchmark that you're setting up to yourself. As Beat mentioned, if, if your previous target was days and you're moving it to seconds or minutes, by definition, you have, you have been able to better, uh, a better solution for the market. So, so that could drive your adoption. Uh, so that, that's for the scalability. I think what's more interesting is for the interoperability itself. So I think everyone here on the table, we're using potentially different blockchain protocols. No, no one knows who is going to be the winning protocol if there is to be one in five to 10 years. And uh, the fact that for some time we need to build bridges between the different platform in order to offer an end-to-end -end services to the client. If, if I look at the way that Coventis is going to do trade execution, but that we will need to connect to a platform that does trade finance, there needs to be bridges built between the different platform in order to really create this, I'm going to use it, ecosystem where, the, where you have an end-to-end -end, uh, experience from the user. So, the, this, this is where we see that the different players need to collaborate in order to make sure that this is not, uh, the data is not lost. Because if you're putting something on a blockchain to then go off platform to go back to another platform, then you have defeated the entire purpose of what you were trying to achieve in, in the first place. So connection between the, the different platform is going to be key in order to make sure that the, the progress that we made in one area can be done for the entire process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe Wait. just. Yeah. Ah, so I just no, want no, no. to add one comment uh, to what just Julian said. Um, yeah, I mean you mentioned the ecosystem. Really, we have to echo on that because we start with a use case, but there are loads of additional services which can um, increase the value add for the participants. And we just take, for example, you have a container um, or some freight you want to make sure you can basically track that and then you can link some some financial flows to that but in order to make it even more valuable you want to add some insurance on it or you want to add some let's see some iot data on it and for that it's super critical that this can work together with with other market participants or with other blockchains so the true value if you look forward a bit more into the future 
you can only unlock when these different chains or ecosystems can effectively talk to each other and, and, and augment each other. I think which, which, which brings us to, an, to another key problem. I mean, when we see in the future, we need to be interoperable be, between these different platforms to get scale. I think we can, can conclude on, on, on that one. Of course, that means as well, so there is the technical one, but Julian mentioned as well, at the end, when you travel from one net platform to another platform, there's as well the, the, the legal framework aspect to it. And that you, you all have now solutions that you are working on or initiatives that you're working on. And of course, um, the, the, the legal framework around it. I mean, it is all about trade. Huh? So there is a po moment where you are ag uh, agreeing on a, on, a, on a deal and that has, re uh, that has uh, then results out of it. So somebody needs to pay somebody out of it. So, and, and that, of course, is always a legal framework that you need to do. In your, in your initiatives, how, how difficult was it actually to set up such legal frameworks between the parties and what could you give us as suggestions uh, uh, for future uh, projects on that? I know if you want to uh, start on that, uh, uh, Benjamin, perhaps. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes, on legal frameworks uh, that, uh, that mm. your solutions may have as well. So you need to have certain standardizations around it. Yep. Um, okay, so, yeah, I would say that it's roughly, it's, it's, it's actually following the similar legal frameworks that the institutions are already abiding by. I mean, there's a few use cases that are here today. Uh, they are already in the market. If you talk about capital markets in my, in my uh, area, or for trade finance with Fiat, right? So these are already well-established um, operational protocols. So I do see that, you know, uh, because we are dealing with the good actors and credible institutions, they are still handling the transactions in the same way as before, just that they're handling in a much quicker fashion. So in the legal framework, it's actually uh, more facilitating, okay, for the legal uh, uh, representation and credibility of the transactions. So you're basically building on the existing one and yep. you're replacing the backbone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is that as well the case with other ones that you mainly say uh, we are using the existing uh, world of, of, of trade and of, of legal rules around it and just replace the technology behind that? Would you share that view? Uh, Shikai, Julian? Sure. I can chip in a little bit. Uh, based on what we have seen from the startups uh, that we are in touch with, uh, there, there usually isn't some sort of uh, license or a new legal framework that uh, that you try to go for and, and that's typically kind of a killer for startups if you need to you know, come up with a whole new financial uh, regulation framework or, or you need to uh, apply for a license for a long time before you can uh, even get going right uh, so what typically is the the easiest path to get started uh, is to simply be you know the technology partner uh, for a certain established player uh, and then after that, from there, you can start to look at where can you venture into if you want to become a, an entity yourself. So one of our startups in the energy industry, for example, uh, he had some clients and he just put them to the platform, uh, settled the, the trades with, with blockchain. And then he later on got a certification from one of the international green energy bodies because he's doing green energy trading. Uh, another one simply worked with, uh, for example, uh, UNICEF and Gabby for the vaccines uh, Distribution. So this is uh, static from the current uh, cohort with, with Ben. Uh, so they, they do not need to have their own uh, legal framework because then they operate within the bounds and the practices of these established organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're right. I think, uh, Mauro, we have another question. We do, yes. Um, basically, Angelica Bienz had a question. Um, Rally is going to quickly give her uh, access to, to a Tell us herself her question. Let's wait for that. Angelica, can you hear us? <coughs> yes, hello. Hello, hi. Yeah, I, uh, my question is about like very basic non-blockchain problems when it comes to inter interoperability. When I listen a little bit to some um, input from the Singapore, the Starks as well from UBS, like uh, when different parties have to work together, even 
like within a company which is a little bit larger it's often a little bit of competition about um, yeah how the process once has been thought of and then one has um, language to that you know like data language it's called or a data model is is how have you solved that <coughs> like uh, within your different blockchain projects how has been the the governance process everyone talks about decentralization but like within a team it's also kind of decentralized and um, working together how did that work with this data standardization things yes i think um, yeah how, how how did we come over that probably a dominant market player is dominating others in a group you know and says well the standard has to look my way i don't know julian you probably had the highest competition in your group <laughs> yeah um it's it's a good question in the sense that uh when you when you're trying to build it you need to make sure that the the language that you're going to use so not necessarily the data language but also the the the, the business process itself uh, you're going to speak about the same thing. Maybe you, you call it a vessel name or someone is going to call it uh, the name of the ship. So you need to make sure that you, you, you use the same data standards to, to talk about the same things. Uh, the view that you will have someone dominant trying to impose uh, within a group, uh, it, it's not that obvious, I would say. You will, they, in the end, these people have been doing business for many, many, many years together and they understand each other already. So there might be minor tweaks in the way that you call something, but already creating a, a standard or harmonizing the, the way you, you use the data uh, was not the most difficult part. Like uh, you, do, you do it by consensus. So, so it's a typical, uh, I would say, blockchain way of doing it as well. You define the consensus mechanism among, among the different users initially to say, okay, this is how we're going to call these very, very specific aspects. And you cannot really impose it to, to the rest saying this is my way or the right way because you need to make sure that everyone is going to use it in the end. So I think we go back to the point that if you want to do something new, it's good, but you need to bring value directly to the future users. And in order to do that, you need to be disruptive, but not too much from a business standpoint. Because if, you, if you're already imposing blockchain, then you're imposing a new way of doing it, then you're imposing something new. Uh, on a larger scope, it's too difficult to cope. So you're going to to start small on this one. Okay. So, yeah. Anybody else to comment on the problem with languages and the problem of uh, aligning different people? I also think that one of the easier things that we can do at the start is to first use some of the common standards that's already out there. So I do know there are new standards coming up uh, from the token space, but for existing um, capital markets or enterprise um, solutions, that's usually this use of the ISO standard anyway in messaging transactions between enterprises. So it's not just uh, financial institutions, but even uh, programming language, for example, that's a standard way to define the computer date and time. Yeah, so all these ISO standards uh, really out there that we could use as the base reference for the messaging uh, transactions between enterprises one and two other so that this could be a common base point and over a period over a period of time i think we've been lucky to see a good spirit of collaboration so far between multiple enterprises mm -hmm. such that we are able to come together and if there's any modification or improvement needed so far it has always been quite generally well accepted as long as the first base reference was from something that was already existing, so that's easier to pick up. I totally agree with that. So when you have something that is already existing and you can make the analogy and say, okay, well, you know, this in this new solution is now a re uh, the, the replacing this and this process, I think that's a key, that's a key, uh, that makes it much more easier uh, to describe it. Yeah. In the, we, we have now heard a lot about consortium. I mean, a lot of these initiatives that you were talking about, they were developed in consortiums. Uh, is the consortium the, 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 the key success factor for, for getting reach? Because at the end, it's all platforms. And platforms are only as successful as they get reach, uh, as they get uh, as many participants on the platform 
uh, then only platforms really are successful at the end. Um, is, is consortium the, 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 the right business model to bring enterprise blockchain solutions alive or are there as well other solutions or other uh, 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 models uh, to bring such solutions alive? What do you think? What's your opinion on that, uh, uh, Claudio? Yeah, we can yeah, I was reflecting on what you said. Well, actually, um, if in a consortium we also take um, the question is the problem with the consortium is that of governance. So, from that point of view, leading uh, this kind of solutions or uh, granting them to another organization, perhaps it is a more sane idea. Uh, uh, because otherwise, what you what was mentioned before regarding a key player inside of the consortium inequalities and so on and so forth are going to manifest themselves as well in the way in which all the consortium is managed. So a third party organization in a way um, that's more independent is always a, a, a good approach to that. And which brings um, to the to the point raised before that uh, is the tension that exists between going fully into a fully decentralized system which you do not control anything like ethereum or something like this that was mentioned before when talking about the standardization processes uh, with respect to things that are completely built around the consortium like corda or uh, hyperledger like solutions um, and what I will say is that it's going to really depend on the business model and the business area. I think that both suite, they have their own use cases. Uh, in many of them, having a fully decentralized approach and even a third party blockchain, it doesn't make any sense at all. Okay, thank you. Um, Johannes and, and Timo, what kind of model do you think uh, you want to establish to bring your um, your uh, initiative alive. Are you thinking about opening a consortium or is it a different approach you want to take? So basically as a university we um, we don't uh, we don't think about um, offering a consortium as such but it's more like uh, building up the expertise of um, evaluating different uh, blockchain standards and um, comparing these to each other. So we see basically us as a more some kind of a neutral observer and consultant um, providing companies, especially providing logistics companies with the necessary information if they want to get involved in the blockchain space. So uh, it's not for us about um, setting up a, a business model or, or something like that. It's um, more that we yeah, we see us as a facilitator for blockchain knowledge and especially in the in the logistics and supply chain area for companies who want to uh, to want to know a bit more about blockchain and help them to evaluate if it really makes sense for them to adopt some kind of blockchain model. Yes, um, for the university, I would totally agree um, to rather take a um, consulting part in it because business models are not the, the best fit for a university or for a research company, um, but I can also uh, answer from a different perspective because um, um, my company that is working for uh, that is a small startup that is working in the blockchain uh, space called Chainsap here in Hamburg. We are actually working in different consortia um, for different pro uh, projects, but what I figure out is that when people come together to figure out how to come up with a business model, a consortia could be a good idea to, especially if um, you're state funded, if the country you're in is actually, um, it's encouraging you to do research and to come up with new models for a new technology. A consortia is a really good part to or it's a really good idea to bring something alive. But when you found an idea or a product or you actually want to bring something to the market and to 
bring real value behind the idea. I think having too many partners is um, not productive anymore. And I think there's a small step or there's a line to draw between having a consortium and having a lot of different views and maybe a lot of expertise. And on the other hand, having an agile company or agile startup to actually bring something to the market and to actually be able to focus on one specific problem that you want to solve. And I think the more people you have, obviously your expertise will increase, but also it will slow down the process. And I think for most of the blockchain technology or for most of the projects or business ideas nowadays, they won't need a big company behind it to develop the idea, but rather have an agile team and an idea that can scale with becoming more mature. So I think there are advantages to both of them. And I think there's a reason to have both like a company and a consortium. Um, yeah, but I think that is developing the more the technology matures. Yeah, uh, CK. I mean, you had you have various uh, uh, startups in in your in your uh, venture and in your accelerator. What is what would you say is the is our successful models? We heard that not only one model is the right one. So the consortium model is one was definitely key for for some of the initiatives, but it's not the only one. What 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 other models would you say um, are successful? Yeah. Yeah. So what, what I, my perspective is that it depends on the use case and what benefits you're trying to bring, right? So if the benefits, like uh, many of our fellow panelists have said, you know, is the transparency, the standardization, digitization between players, then a consortium makes a lot of sense. For some of the other solutions where it's, it's basically one use case and you're serving somebody, uh, an enterprise who functions as a platform already, so it's simply kind of like offering that digitization solution, tokenization solution to that platform is itself, it's like kind of forming a mega consortium because they're already handling so many players from like multi-sided marketplace or like from two-sided marketplace. Uh, one example here is one of our uh, earlier startups, Alpha Wallets. So they created a tokenization standard uh, for, uh, for Ethereum actually, but they also brought this to enterprises to create new business models for for assets. So, for example, they tokenize the tickets to the UFA uh, World Cup. So, the, and then subsequently to a different uh, FIFA World Cup as well. So, once you have the tickets tokenized by the issuer, then they can use this to tie it to like entrance and also ticket uh, to like merchandise purchasing to, to different teams. And then they also brought it to a different player who uh, manages the bartering system in Australia and they're the largest player there and they handle like uh, tens of thousands of like, players, hundreds of thousands of trades. So just by tokenizing them, just by getting these enterprises, it's, it's sufficient to then scale your solution. Always uh, a consortium that will work for every use case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. I mean, Ben, you you did not work in consortium either, I think, when you, when you brought your, your solution to the market. Yeah, so we're offering it as a platform in addition to their existing market platforms. But the uh, interesting thing to note is that many of the clients or institutions, they have also expressed interest to maintain the network together because obviously they are also looking at scaling up the business use cases into further users uh, beyond what they are already looking at. So that's why I think that uh, initially, while well, it's quick to go to market, okay, for scaling and size and expanded functions, the consortium might actually provide the legitimacy and credibility among themselves. Thank you very much. Well, this was an exciting panel. Um, time's already running out. We are already a little bit over time, actually. Um, I, I found it exciting uh, because I, I heard a lot about uh, the key success factors. I mean, we started with saying, okay, it definitely needs to have a use case, a use case that brings an economic value. Um, so, I mean, many of you said 
we are replacing something that is uh, very time consuming, which is of a, has a lot of risks, uh, risk costs, cost of execution, transaction costs for uh, a lot of the, uh, the participants. So these are kind of use cases we can bring um, uh, the economic value with blo enterprise blockchain solutions. Then um, Ben was as well saying the integration into existing processes, into existing platforms is really uh, very, very, very key and important and, and, and crucial. Um, uh, so, so as well, Claudia was referring to it. And another thing is, um, you know, the, to bring it alive is not always, always having the right people uh, involved in it and the right uh, platforms involved in it. It's as well about the um, having the the, yeah, the right people and uh, and consortiums are not always the right uh, model to do. Uh, it could be as well that just building a platform and growing uh, growing from one player to another player and then connecting these players to together. Uh, so step by step and uh, going from small to large is is very key. I don't know, Claudia, what your uh, takeaway is from an academic perspective from this panel as um, giving you the last word. Uh, you, are, you are mute. You just muted yourself. <laughs> so the, sorry, I thought that I unmuted myself. So thank you very much for your kindness, Dennis. So I think that it, this panel it shows the, the interest perspectives that exist and also the uh, amount of open questions. I think that even the people from industry is performing a lot of, um, at the end of the day, this is a research task that we are doing. We're always discovering new things. And uh, I really look forward that we are able to solve and to bring forward this technology. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody for uh, this uh, participating in the panel. Um, I wish you a very pleasant weekend. If uh, you, I hope the audience enjoyed it as well and um, filled out the poll of our research topics very heavily, Mauro. And it, it actually, they, they yeah. did, yes. Thanks they a lot, did. everybody. We will send the results to the group and, uh, you know, we take, we'll then start uh, working with the universities on these topics. Yeah. And I would welcome everybody to join as well the Crypto Valley Association and especially as well the Crypto Valley Enterprise Blockchain Working Group because we are doing, apart from these public events as well, uh, smaller events where we have uh, uh, students that are working on these uh, research and present their the, the results of the thesis uh, within the Crypto Valley Association. So it is definitely value to join the association uh, here and uh, to benefit from these one-to-ones with, uh, with more details on particular research topics. So I want to thank everybody uh, for participating today and um, hope to see you next time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you.